Happy Thursday, everyone, and welcome to this Lightband webinar for June 6th, 2019, titled Migrating from Java EE to Cloud Native Reactive Systems. My name is Oliver White, Chief Storyteller and MC at Lightband, and joining me today is my friend and colleague, Marcus Isola. Marcus is a Java champion, creator of the German-based conference Java Land, and director of developer ad advocacy at Lightband, and as he might mention in this presentation, a fan of coffee. While I introduce today's session, which should last around 30 minutes plus time for q and I'd like to ask our audience a quick poll question. If you are currently migrating from Java EE to cloud native systems, what would help you most? So if you've been following Lightbend and our Scala, Akka, Play, and Logum community projects for a while, then you're probably wondering why we're talking about Java EE today. Well, as we've grown year over year, we're having more conversations, not only with hardcore Akka and Scala users, but also large enterprises that have decades of legacy systems in place, including everything from Java EE to Ruby on Rails, and they're in need of modernization. After all, it's not entirely simple to drop Java EE for Akka, yet many of our largest customers like Starbucks, HPE, Verizon, and Capital One found that this is exactly what the doctor ordered for achieving the scale and speed that for their systems that was previously impossible. One thing that's really driving this all is that a lot of businesses that never before considered themselves as technology companies are now faced with digital modernization imperatives. And this is forcing them to rethink how they build their applications and host it on different types of infrastructure. Many of these uh, businesses have begun to realize something when it comes to using Java EE in a cloud native environment that Java EE isn't particularly good for, nor was ever intended to be used in these highly dynamic cloud-based environments. And for organizations that have huge investments in legacy Java EE infrastructure where technical debt and monolithic system architectures are now causing significant business problems, well, modernization is really the only way forward if you want to be relevant in the next five years. And that's why Marcus is joining us today. He's gonna to describe some of the things that make Java EE a rather poor fit for modern cloud native application development, some of the reasons why the world is evolving from Java EE to real-time streaming applications, often deployed to the cloud, as well as how you can start to replace Java EE with cloud native reactive applications to get started faster and see a, a return on investment rather quickly. All right, thank you for voting. Just a little bit of housekeeping. As always, today's webinar is made possible only by people like you encouraging your company to become one of Lightbend's hundreds of happy customers, like our client Rewards Network. They use real-time streaming data to help over 10,000 restaurants in the United States build loyalty and reward customers online. They're looking for engineers with experience and DevOps methodologies in Chicago. You can find out more about this position and other open positions with Lightbend customers on lightbend.com under the About tab. Also, next week is the 10th anniversary of Scala Days. So if anyone online with us today will be in Lausanne, Switzerland to celebrate Scala Days 10th anniversary, come by the Lightband booth and say hello. I'll be there along with many other Lightbenders. As always, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be shared with you in the next week. If you have questions, please add them to the GoToWebinar control panel and we'll see if we can get around to them in the Q&A part of today's session. And if you're an existing subscriber, then you know that you have unlimited access to our expert engineers through the customer portal where you can ask any additional technical questions, what ifs, how to's, and best practices. Okay, that's all from me. Let's hand it over to Marcus. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Oliver. Our last webinar has been a while, right? I mean, we yeah, rarely yeah. get the chance. You keep lining up so many amazing people, so I don't have to speak and people can actually just see me at conferences. And uh, you already spoiled. Well, I don't consider that a benefit. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you already spoiled. Um, my most favorite conference I've ever been to um, is the one I've created myself, which is called Java Land. Um, it's mostly famous because uh, it's actually happening in a theme park. So, uh, have you been there, Oliver? You have, right? Yes. Not yes, there. I was there in 2014, I believe, the inaugural Java Land. It was a very fun uh, conference, it's, and it's in a big German theme park, which is pretty hilarious. 
roller coasters all over. So um, I think they already have like almost 2,000 attendees. It's coming up March next year. And um, even if I'm no longer actively involved um, with that conference in particular, uh, I'll definitely try to get my speaking slot there. But uh, let's not make this a lot more about me. Um, Oliver said that I'm leading developer relations advocacy for Lightbend. If you want to listen to my rumblings, mostly around Java, if you follow my conference experiences and uh, talks, just uh, go to Twitter. I'm my fear. And uh, yeah, that's probably going to be all I'm, I'm talking about in terms of myself today. Um, let's talk about this little gem here, um, a trademark that uh, probably many of us um, actually have grown up with. And uh, if I have to admit that uh, many, 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 many moons ago, my technically my technical career started uh, when I worked with the first uh, J2EE, and uh, I was implementing enterprise Java beans and uh, JSP pages and all these fancy things. And uh, over the turn of the last couple of years, Java Enterprise Edition. Um, managed to, to actually be the platform choice for for many corporations, and uh, I, I think it's it's pretty clear. Um, this is actually a slide that uh, I borrowed uh, with approval from the Eclipse marketing team. As uh, you know, the uh, Java E trademark is is no more, technically speaking, under Oracle. But uh, Oracle donated to Java EE, um, including specifications and source code, to the Eclipse Foundation, where it will be continued as Jakarta EE going forward. And uh, if, if we're asking ourselves what the advantages are of actually working in that space and, and how it could be that Java EE got so successful over the years, um, I think the number one reason was actually stability. We could literally just grab a random person, um, maybe an information technology student from the street, and uh, ask them to implement uh, some kind of uh, surflet or anything like that. And uh, this is uh, this is something that makes uh, resourcing super easy. Um, everybody could rely on specifications. Uh, we had a lot of people that were actually able to work in these kind of environments. And um, just, I think, I can't even remember when that was. That must have been beginning of 2018. Um, back in the days, the Jakarta E community started a little survey about the, the technical direction into the, into the Java E specification should evolve. And uh, I, I think the, the numbers are, are pretty clearly directing into the direction of what we see as of today. Um, even way beyond the actual microservices hype. Um, just just a year ago, people already asked for more support for Kubernetes, for a more native integration with more language support. Um, there's even mention of Node.js in, in these uh, surveys, right? And a large portion of answers mentioned that building microservices is a thing they are actually doing right now or they are planning to do uh, a microservice-based architecture within a year from that. And uh, that is definitely something that has never been at the core of what Java EE as a centralized application infrastructure uh, was aimed for in terms of um, specifications and design. So the number one question that everybody keeps asking me, and, and here's a little gem. So if you start Googling uh, Marcus Eisele and you'll um, add the term Java E, you'll find my name on the Java E7 expert group. So I've actually been involved with uh, creating these specifications and developing them further. Um, so me talking about microservices architectures and distributed systems is uh, is working some people up because they don't really understand how I can uh, make uh, make statements about the technology they love and uh, honestly I, I love the technology um, as it is today I'm just saying that there might be more choices today and better choices actually um, so given all the the requests and uh, the ideas that came out of that community survey um, let's take a step back and look at the history of Java E a little and uh, this is a slide I've been using in, in many, many of my presentations already. 
but it outlines pretty clearly where Java E actually came from. Invented somewhere in between 97, 99, that's almost 20 years ago. It was pretty quickly supplemented by Spring, um, at least the first ideas what Rod Johnson back in the days created, and that's already 17 years ago. And uh, just 2003, in that time frame, this is where Twitter came to life, I think, the first like large platform internet um, applications that needed some, some different approach to scaling. And uh, they actually went with completely different technologies, um, in this case, Ruby and Rails, and um, they still relied on, on relational databases. Um, I think Twitter in particular used MySQL back in the days. And if we follow that, that timeline a little bit more, um, just 10 years ago, ACA was created. Um, yeah, happy anniversary. Um, so we have a couple of uh, interesting anniversary goodies um, online. So if you follow Lightband or the ACA team handle on Twitter, you could probably still um, contribute to a little ACA trivia and uh, maybe win a t-shirt. Uh, the competition ends uh, at Scala days. So Oliver is actually going to draw the winner and announce it via our Twitter handle, just uh, as a nice little side effect. But as you can see, the, the topics around distributed applications and microservices and even the, the newest member of this kind of hype is that they all started pretty recently compared to the maturity and age of, of Java EE and its pre predecessors, right? So um, with the significant amount of more data, the question is, is this just something that people are interested in developing and uh, using in terms of new technologies? Is that kind of hype-driven development? Or is there actually a need? Um, and uh, because I was so curious, just a couple of days ago, I ran a little, little Twitter poll, which might actually be heavily influenced by my audience, which is probably Java-oriented. But um, the, the shift away from these standard platforms can definitely be seen in this poll. And uh, yes, I do admit that it was not clearly phrased, but uh, just looking at the uh, monoliths that people are actually building, uh, just 17% of people who are building new applications as of today are using still using the Java E approach. I got a bunch of feedback um, that uh, told me that they are not allowed to use something different. That's the only like standardized tool set that they, they want to use going forward, um, which I think will definitely go down further. Uh, we also see almost 30% of people doing some kind of micro-profile-based um, services-based development. And uh, I was pretty surprised um, to see that already 30% are doing some kind of re reactive development. And yes, I've mentioned Play as an example, but uh, definitely there are other frameworks out there. And the others in this case um, mentioned pretty much everything, including Node.js. So I think what this clearly states is the, the shift away from the standardized platform decisions that big corporations made back in the days. The solution space that we as developers actually have to handle got a lot more broader. And I think um, the, the biggest reason for that is actually uh, the invention of containers and container orchestration, which makes it a lot easier um, to run some kind of standardized packages uh, on standardized infrastructure. So we no longer have to standardize on deployments, but now we can standardize on something that people use, containers, for example. It's, uh, it's probably also very visible here that, uh, that the requirements change for applications going forward. Um, it's no longer just shoveling all kinds of data into a centralized database. It's more like handling a massive amounts of data in a more dynamic setting. Um, speaking of real-time processing, for example, and uh, last but not least, um, the global 5000s are, are starting to consider themselves as technology companies. They are becoming digital on-demand providers and uh, development speed for new applications actually is uh, becoming the ultimate competitive advantage for them. So cloud native and the future of Java EE. Um, I think the biggest monolith 
that have been developed in the last 20 years followed a classical waterfall driven development approach and even if we learned even if we know how to handle more agile methodologies um, the monoliths that were successfully implemented and are still running as of today and I have to admit even some of the bigger ones that I implemented back in my days when I was uh, still a principal architect uh, at a German-based SI, um, they are still running and they're doing a wonderful job. It's just getting insanely more harder to actually modernize them, to constantly keep evolving them. And uh, the one of the main reasons is that these technical three-tier designs combined with the ongoing changes of the last 10 to 15 years and the addition of new requirements, maybe legal requirements or um, just new business requirements, ultimately collide directly with these inflexible team structures that had been designed for monolithic code bases. And if we look at uh, data centers as they are today, um, Honestly, having a big Java EE application server underneath my small and lightweight war archive and uh, having that big thing run in 500 megabytes and more gigabytes of RAM, um, it makes the whole thing insanely expensive to scale and unnecessarily expensive. Um, I mean, for us as Java developers, uh, we don't necessarily need Java E application servers. There's a couple of neat supportive frameworks and specifications that definitely help us get stuff done. But uh, ultimately what we really need is a JVM, so something really lightweight um, on where we can actually deploy our stuff. on. Um, so bottom line, all those monoliths from the last couple of years built on Java E technologies, um, led to a very resource inefficient deployment and development strategy. And uh, on top of all of that, the notion of data in motion is not really supported. If we're looking at, uh, at today's examples, like the, the poster childs of actual applications running. I mentioned Twitter so far. Just think about the insane amount of people tweeting at the same time and streaming data to those backends. Just think about a write share application. Um, just think about um, energy grids that need to distribute uh, massive amounts of solar power coming in during daytimes on, on various continents and time zones. Um, all these kind of requirements just from a business perspective let us as developers to the fact that we need to find a different solution for handling these amounts of data. Java EE has no notion of streaming. There is no support for Akka streams, obviously. There's there's no support for Apache Spark, Kafka, and nothing. There are ways of integrating all of these things, but uh, speaking from the specification perspective, from the technical advantages, from the history that made Java EE big as a standard, as a platform that people really wanted to use, all these advantages are gone now. And uh, on top of all of that are the trivial data persistence models that you actually need to use, which is mainly JPA coupled to a classical RDBMS. And uh, event-driven or message-driven systems um, that can actually handle this massive amount of real-time data rely on, on some completely different persistence mechanism, modern persistence mechanism called CQRS and uh, event sourcing. So um, these couple nicely with microservice architectures, by the way. So this whole movement away from a monolithic um, world into a more streaming world where data in motion is actually the most important part, um, many people have seen that coming. And uh, yeah, I'm absolutely in love with that Gartner quote for many reasons. First of all, I always wanted to have a Gartner quote in one of my presentations. Uh, and second of all, it's it's just so true. This is a technology choice that made sense back in the days with different requirements. And uh, today, technology leaders agree that these modern system architectures must embrace a cloud-first strategy. 
um, to capture the benefits of development, agility, and ultimately cost efficiency in the cloud. And uh, that is totally true. And even if we if we look back, maybe with a tear in our eyes, at uh, what Monolith on application servers actually allowed us to to do, they they gave us consistency. They they took we could take it for granted, right? We could think about failures, we could catch exceptions, but we never had to think about like deep down system things going wrong. So EJB is actually a good example that I always keep coming back to. So EJBs had a life cycle, or they still have. I'm speaking about Java E as it's already dead. It it's, might actually still be a reasonable choice for certain kinds of applications, just not for the modern ones, right? So, um, but back to EJBs. Um, EJBs actually have a life, life cycle. So they got passivated when nobody used them and uh, the application server tried to actually read them back the serialized state from the, from the file system. We never had to look after EJBs. It, they've always been there. And uh, pretty much the same was true for transactions that we spawned. Uh, we actually had something like um, distributed transactions, um, or at least we were made believe that distributed transactions exist and work. So everything was handled for us. Failure was handled. We could never run into the situation where we only had partial updates from different components in the same database. Concurrency was handled. We had no uncommitted reads. It, it was a good world and it was an easy world to live in. Unfortunately, when thinking about microservice architectures or distributed applications in general, this consistent view of the world simply breaks down. Um, there, there is no single state in the database that we could just read and treat as the ultimate, ultimate ratio, right? I mean, it just is somewhere in the system. and uh, that is just because the system actually now is made out of many, many different parts. Individual services, for example. And uh, just this little little picture to the right, um, this little graphic, just imagine requests coming in to service A and, and service F and uh, going downstream, fanning out to B and C or just follow every single path in there. And just imagine one of these services actually being engaged in, in these kind of service call chains breaking. In which kind of state does this whole system ends up being, right? Um, there's nothing that handles failure in these kind of architectures and designs for us. Um, it's most likely that these individual microservices who are solely responsible for their data, uh, including everything they had to like persist somewhere, um, end up having a different state at some point. So we need to, need to figure out how we can handle that. Nothing is enforced at that point anymore. And even operations might take some time to propagate throughout the system. So while one service already has up-to-date and recent information, the other one probably is still waiting for some kind of updates after that. So what worked in Monolith will not work anymore. Um, there's no, no CRUD, there's no transactions, there's no restfulness based on HTTP transports. What is actually need is a messaging-based, events-based system that has a very stream-centered view and treat the actual data as events in the system. And this is what we call the shift towards the real-time streaming systems or enterprises. Distributed systems based on reactive principles have to follow a couple of high-level guidances. Reactive systems at their foundation are powered by asynchronous, non-blocking, message-driven communication. Ideally enabling supervision, isolation, replication, uh, of failed processes, so we can replay stuff that probably went south. We also need to make sure and realize that re resilience goes further than fault tolerance in general. We need a self-healing ability 
in an automated and predicted way that uh, treat the, the, the parts of the full service application lifecycle and, uh, and makes sure that we have the message-driven approach uh, to communication taking care for potential situations that end up putting the system in a bad state. And we also need to make sure elasticity um, is treated more in the uh, veins of efficiency. And uh, we need to make sure that the message-driven foundation of our applications can scale easily. This does not only mean it can scale easily up, but it also uses a lot less resources. The thing that is mostly underrepresented is the responsive part of the systems. The, uh, the customers actually are having the biggest advantage out of reactive applications because those systems are designed and built in ways that they can always serve customers. There's a consistently responsive user experience, which is highly available and never fails, even during busy times or when something goes sideways in the system in general. To get there is a little bit of a challenge. I'm not telling you news when uh, I'm pointing you directly into the direction of domain-driven design. Um, I think every reasonable talk or webinar you've seen in the past about microservice architectures and how to get there um, actually makes sure that you take these lessons from an events first domain driven design approach to have your encapsulated microservices to apply isolation between the uh, loosely coupled services and that you separate domains of concern accordingly. Um, as a side note, something that uh, we might actually uh, be able to include in the follow-up blog post, there is a wonderful um, reading series, which is uh, like, I think, Units 1 to 8, built by our friends at IBM and published for free on IBM developers. Um, a very good friend of, of Lightband, Kevin Weber, uh, based out of Canada, he actually um, created a Logum course, and uh, Logum is our microservices framework on the JVM, and uh, he actually walks you through uh, the whole magic, what needs to be done from the very top, modeling your business according to an events-first approach, following domain-driven design principles, all the way down to implementing your first services. So Oliver, um, you might actually take a mental note, please, uh, so we can add that little information to the follow-up blog post. Sure, no problem. Um, before you do think about efficiencies in the data center, you actually need to think about resilience of your application. And uh, there are a couple of things that I already touched on in an earlier slide. I just want to make sure they get a very explicit mention. We need to make sure that those services-based distributed architectures don't need human intervention in case of failure. Um, this is easily said, um, but what you actually need is a self-healing automated system that supports supervision. And uh, to the right, what you what you see there, which people might actually um, interpret as a wonderful flower, which is not, this is an actor system. And this actor system shows you the um, hierarchies, first of all, of the individual actors that are spawned in the system. The numbers represent the number of messages um, that are flowing through the system. And uh, every little path you follow from the, the center of the actor system down to leave um, is uh, kind of a supervision here hierarchy. And this is automatic, like built in, very easy to design and makes sure that nobody actually has to restart something or pods. This is all automatically controlled. Um, this is only possible if you make sure that um, you adhere to the design principles. So isolating and containing failures um, is something that is really necessary in these kind of applications. And um, 
the system responsiveness requires a little different approach to designing these systems, but it is highly efficient. One thing that I wanted to just uh, give you as homework, um, because I have two wonderful girls and I always thought I hate homework as a student. I'm totally mistaken as a parent, you start hating homework even more. Um, so I'm giving you a little bit of that um, just to make you laugh a little. You need to learn about reactive streams and this is a simple, um, simple example of a stream going from left to right, sending messages from Kafka to a WebSocket. Um, very easy, very straightforward, something that is actually possible across various implementations because Reactive Streams is a separate and independent specification that is, uh, in this case, implemented by Akka Streams. And while messages get propagated from the source to the target, um, we also communicate something back, which is called back pressure, and that prevents the uh, low level components from being overloaded. Just assume that the WebSocket can handle the 10,000 messages produced by Kafka. Um, so he can actually communicate back and let the producer know, hey, dial it back a little bit. I can handle all that load. Uh, we need to make sure that we are able to send the right amount of messages and not overload the system. Thinking of Java EE or uh, Java uh, microservices, um, the, the most likely outcome you see if you start to overload individual services is an out of memory um, exception, right? So this is something you don't want to see. Streams is the, um, the most intense and um, down to earth building block of microservice based systems. And you should definitely invest a little bit more time learning about that. We touched on additional cloud ROI a little bit. Um, to address the business challenges of modernizations, many of the most admired brands around the globe are actually transforming their businesses with Lightband. And uh, we're engaging billions of users every day through um, our software. And our customers are actually disrupting markets with uh, what they do. We provide scalable, high-performance microservices frameworks. Uh, I already mentioned Lagom. Um, you know Arca, that's also been mentioned. Uh, play is something that uh, people love to use. We love to support Play. Um, it's a full stack web framework that has a lot of neat developer features. And of course, all our frameworks support both sides. So um, Scala as a programming language is supported as much as Java because we all run on the same JVM. We enable product teams who are using our technologies to actually focus on the business logic. Um, no low-level protocols, but a neat DSL that allows people to actually achieve goals very quickly and fast. Um, especially the uh, guard-railed approaches to microservices, speaking of Logom, eliminate a lot of plumbing and stuff and uh, single points of failures uh, that gives you a very easy head start. And, uh, they are all a very good and simple fit for cloud-based infrastructures because they don't require heavyweight middleware that needs to be deployed accordingly. All of these frameworks take uh, total advantage from the JVM as the one thing that they require to run on. Ultimately, for many enterprises, using data-driven insights uh, to deepen customer engagement over the web or mobile or IoT applications is the focal point of digital transformation. Um, so shifting these architectures um, from a batch data in, in REST to a streaming data in motion approach is a super important part of new product developments today. And these digital transformation initiatives at large enterprises are being sparked by, by either the innovators dilemma in which market leaders, success and capabilities have actually become obstacles, um, or the reinventors in which successful companies are using a key asset to, to capture a new market. Um, the, 
the frameworks, the lightweightness of all of them help you to go to market a lot quicker. So time to value with an improved agility following all the organizational recommendations from the microservice architectures um, will definitely be achieved in very short times. And uh, when you use a lot less compute resources on cloud infrastructures from cloud providers, um, you can reduce cost um, significantly. Developer happiness is something that I'm totally happy for. And I have to admit, um, all of our frameworks are making people happy. Um, so you should just pick one and give it a try. Um, I, I actually heard there's a logum release coming very soonish. Um, that's still my, my most beloved framework um, out of our stack because it has such a nice and easy onboarding experience. So if you want to get started with uh, reactive applications, microservices on the JVM without the bloat in terms of application middleware, that is definitely something you need to look into. And um, as you can imagine, the 30 something minutes we're talking today uh, could only scratch a little bit on the surface. So instead of me just giving this webinar, James Roper, my fellow coworker in Lightbend and member of our office of the CTO, and I, we sat together and um, talked about and wrote down what we thought and uh, what it actually takes to modernize traditional Java E applications. Um, I can only encourage you to download this free report. It's uh, it's a nice PDF. So whenever you have to travel or go to like parents' places and have somebody to read a PDF to you, that might actually be a neat thing to do. If you are not satisfied with that, um, you are also more than encouraged to take a look at another free O'Reilly book written by um, our CTO and co-founder uh, Jonas Bonaire. He's explaining in depth the um, necessities for a complete reactive microservices architecture. He walks you through um, the topics mentioned here, isolation, autonomy, why microservices need to do the one thing and just the one thing, um, how state should be owned and handled and how microservices should communicate with each other. Um, did I mention that the book's also free? Yes, it is, definitely. Um, and uh, I, th I think when Jonas wrote that book, I was a little disappointed because only CTOs get to write books. So I actually um, asked my boss if uh, she would be okay with me writing another book. So while Jonas was talking about architectural requirements for microservices infrastructures, I uh, was digging a more, I was taking a more practical approach and uh, I was looking at Logom and uh, this book, which is also free, it's, it's, it's Christmas today, only gifts, um, walks you through developing a microservices-based um, architecture application, simple example, based on Logom. So um, I can only highly encourage you to take all of these uh, books with you. And uh, this is a book that I wrote in my ancient past. I still carry it around in my slides for one reason, because um, when I wrote it, it was meant to help people to understand why Java E applications should actually be redesigned into microservice applications. And uh, this book turned out to be both a recommendation for higher level management to actually do microservices going forward, but also um, preventing people from doing the wrong things with microservices. So it's it's a little bit more of a decision helper and maker. And I still can't let go of this book because it's so good um, and explains a couple of more deep, deeper design patterns that will probably help you when you have to go down that modernization path. Um, as mentioned, there is a blog that I'm very infrequently posting content to. If you want to follow me and learn more about uh, Java, microservices, containers, Kubernetes, all kinds of uh, distributed applications and uh, cloud native applications, then you're more than welcome to follow me on Twitter. I'm uh, taking the freedom to rant from time to time, so take that into account. But uh, besides that, thank you for your patience today with me, and uh, Oliver, 
do we have questions? Is there anything I can hopefully answer? Yes, we do have uh, a couple questions. There's a nice. couple that are that are similar, so I'm trying to meld them into a meta question. And I see that we are on the thank you page, indeed. All right. We are. Um, the first question we have is um, referring to your slide on different types of consistency used in distributed systems. So the question is, you know, uh, we talk a lot about eventual consistency because that's kind of what we need in uh, for distributed microservices, but does that mean that strong consistency is not okay to use or what are the use cases when we can use strong consistency and when we should use eventual consistency, for example? The uh, biggest advantage of eventual consistency is performance, full stop. And depending on the use case that you are working on, eventually consistency is totally fine. And uh, let's look for um, online banking example. Um, this is the typical thing where people expect it to be ultimately consistent, right? But uh, if you go to your um, banking app, you open your account statement, it says accurate as of today, some point in time, right? And uh, maybe not all transactions, withdrawals, whatever you did on, on your account in the meantime to that date haven't been accounted for yet on that statement, right? So ultimately speaking, this table of data is being updated whenever new information is processed. This, technically speaking, is eventual consistent, right? So in this particular use case, all we need to do is inform our customers or users of that application that a statement or a data point is accurate as point in time, right? So um, depending on this use case, it, uh, it might be a viable solution to speed up resources and performance significantly because you don't need to run the heavy weight and, and bulky updates all the time for every single change and you can promote that easier. Um, on, the, on the other hand, you can also start to handle things differently. Um, so consistency on the database level is something that was acquired via logs and transactions in the past. And if we're not using these heavyweight database um, activities anymore, and we're using a more lightweight approach to persisting data, we need to make sure that we're able to spot failures and discrepancies, right? So that kind of um, requires a different approach to solving that business problem. I'm not saying um, going with event sourcing and eventual consistency is the, the only approach for whatever you do. I'm just saying it might be a lot more cost efficient and a lot faster than using JPA or even plain SQL and transactions. Okay, thanks for that answer. Um, one member of the audience is, is looking for some hard evidence on the benefits of microservices and reactive over Java EE and monoliths. Um, and I'm not sure if this person is asking for actual numbers, although we do have that on our website under the case studies, and you can um, pick a tab that says basically microservices or uh, fast data, and you can kind of see some of the stories we have there. But Marcus, um, maybe you could run through again the, the advantages in real life of using microservices over monoliths. I, I can try. I mean, hard evidence is is hard to answer, right? So, yeah. technically speaking, I think the uh, the biggest advantage of microservices um, ultimately is the the speed to market. Everything we capture under developer velocity um, is making your life easier. Instead of working on on a very highly coupled and more technical code base with large teams in a waterfall kind of driven development approach, um, you can now take full advantage of everything you've heard so far, like to pizza teams, we can, uh, we can have a, a solely responsible team for a bunch of services. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking AWS and, and how they realize the web services infrastructure internally and who's taking responsibility for individual services. So just from an, um, from a management perspective, this changes the, the game up completely, right? Um, it also introduces a lot of uh, complexity that is definitely underestimated by many first-timers. So the uh, 
necessity of cutting down release cycles, of gaining developer velocity, and creating a highly distributed system comes with a bunch of advantages but disadvantages, right? So the biggest advantage that we've seen so far in all our customers, and this is why I'm pretty much uh, still showing this slide from um, from somebody at PayPal, um, is that we can get rid of a significant amount of load on existing infrastructures by eradicating these middleware that has been given us as developers a lot of convenience but that we had to pay for in terms of overhead and uh, just technically speaking if you remove the overhead down to a single JVM um, as the deployment infrastructure within a container and, and if you're able to deploy this distributed application easily without any overhead in between um, that alone gives you some really hard numbers that uh, you could easily talk about. Um, somebody, I, I hear somebody literally, do you hear that too, Oliver? Uh, somebody is talking about Spring Boot because that's pretty much the same, right? So nobody is using uh, application servers anymore. Why, why not use Spring Boot? So Spring Boot is, uh, is fancy and Spring Boot is uh, great when you do one microservice. Um, just think about the stuff that I said about supervision, hierarchies, and failure handling. And take that with you and think about it twice. Um, and then come back to me and ask that question again about Spring Boot. But yes, distributed applications can be a lot lighter on your infrastructure and you can save 80% of infrastructure cost while gaining a significant amount of performance out of your application. All right. And folks, for anyone who would like to see uh, more about the PayPal story that's on our website, there's also a guest, pres a guest webinar that Akara who's quoted here, did with Lightbend uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. And he actually goes into detail about what they replaced. Um, they got rid of some uh, legacy Java and Spring stuff. They started using Akka and Akka Streams to process something like a billion and a half events uh, every day, only using eight eight JVMs and, and so on. So they had a the significant uh, performance increase. So that's a good story to check out. Well, Marcus, I'm uh, I'm well aware that you've got two little girls at home that are probably waiting for your attention. So I'll, we'll end uh, today's session on, on that note. Thank you so much for uh, presenting this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, folks, we will be sharing this recording and slides with you sometime next week. It will appear on the Lightbend blog. So don't worry about that if you had a little trouble connecting or maintaining audio. And uh, I wanted to say thanks everyone for joining us today and have a wonderful day. Thanks again, Marcus. Thanks, Oliver. It was a lot of fun. Same for me. Bye, everybody.